Oh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cosmic Coffee coming to you from here at Lowell Observatory. I'm Jeff Hall, an astronomer and the director of the observatory. I'm joined this morning once again by our astronomer, Brian Skiff, uh, who's been on a couple of recent Cosmic Coffees as we've been talking about aspects of the stars. Um, we've also been joined uh, in previous episodes by some of our educators talking about the different types of stars that we're seeing in the sky, particularly at this time of the year, such as the, the winter hexagon and so forth, and noting that stars have different brightnesses, different colors. Uh, Brian and I have talked a little bit about how we determine distance in astronomy. And, 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 and today we're going to um, move into how this, this enormous stellar zoo up there in the sky every night is classified and how astronomers have figured out what the patterns are amongst the stars and how we can use those, those classifications to understand many of the important physical properties about the stars. So what I'm going to do is we, we've got a couple of screen shares for you. We have a, a few PowerPoint slides to discuss sort of the origin of uh, spectroscopy and stellar classification, and then some practical examples online of how this is done and how it all works in astronomy. So uh, thanks for joining us again, Brian. Good morning, everyone. And I am going to share the screen and we'll go back to uh, the birth of a very <laughs> important uh, field of, of astronomy. So Brian, we have a, a famous researcher from the 19th century here. Yeah, <laughs> starting in the, this is, uh, 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 goodness, I've forgotten his first name, Fraunhofer, <laughs> who about, um, about eight, between 1810 and 1820, he uh, uh, made the first real explorations of what the spectra of stars look like. And uh, the easiest thing to work from was the sun uh, and uh, running the light from the sun through a prism and then projecting it onto a white piece of paper or a board perhaps. And he noticed that um, along with all the colors that he could see at least in a darkened room, that there are all these dark lines. And he had, at the time, of course, there was no atomic theory. We only had a few elements that we knew the identifications of. And so he was just exploring stuff and had no idea of what was going on. And, uh, he nevertheless uh, made quite detailed maps of the solar spectrum. And because uh, he didn't know what else to do, he gave them letters, <laughs> ended up with more than a hundred lines that he mapped. And starting with at the red end, for some reason, the uh, folks back then decided that the red end was, was the place to work from <clears throat> and uh, started with the letter A, which turns out not to be a, uh, a feature in the stellar spectra, but instead from the atmosphere, it's from uh, molecular oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. But almost all the other lines from the right-hand side of this plot over to the left are from the sun, from different elements, chemical elements or uh, uh, small molecules in the, in the stars, which we now know are common to many of the stars and obviously stars that are similar to the sun. Um, and so, by the way, it was Joseph, by the way, Joseph, yes, <laughs> Joe to his friends, I'm sure. Right. Go from yep. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so the, the big broad lines are the thicker ones here and the, that have the capital letters were the easy ones to see. And most of those are from uh, hydrogen, which is, we now know is the main constituent of, uh, <clears throat> of the atmospheres of stars. The, so the B, the B line and uh, um, and F and then uh, H are all from hydrogen. The D line, uh, that's actually a pair, were, are from sodium. And then there's uh, uh, lines from helium and magnesium in the middle here. And then the F is uh, another hydrogen line. And then G is again from a small molecule from, uh, it's, it's a CH molecule, I don't know if what the chemical name of that molecule is, but CH and then the K line and the H line, at least in the sun, are from, from ionized calcium. So moving on, you know, people, it, this, this is how things were for about 40 years until the mid 1850s when uh, Kirchhoff and uh, Bunsen in Germany, uh, Bunsen Burner, this is Robert Bunsen of Bunsen Burner fame and Gustav Kirchhoff, um, who were laboratory chemists, basically, um, they showed that the, uh, all these lines were from different 
elements and that had been identified up till that time. And that electrified people. <laughs> yeah. People recognized that, you know, oh, we can actually see that there are real chemical composition uh, differences amongst the stars. Um, so we can, we can actually tell what the stars are made of. And we were talking before the show, it's interesting in the, the literature today, for instance, we never refer to, you know, the Fraunhofer C line. We'll just say that's, that's hydrogen alpha, one of the most <laughs> prominent lines in the spectrum. I'd also right. like to note that sodium D line, which we typically often do call the, the D doublet, um, you know, that look at where that emission is right at a portion of the spectrum that looks fairly amber. And this is, of course, the the emission of the, the best uh, dark skylight, the so-called low pressure sodium, which is now obsolete, but, but that's where it emits. And that's why this, this very good dark sky lighting has that distinct amber color. And of course we've been, we'll look later in the show, we've been studying calcium H and K for decades here at Lowell. Yeah. All right, so. Um, so um, once uh, Kirchhoff and Bunsen had shown in basically from a laboratory's pr perspective that this was this was really diagnostic and we could actually find out about the temperatures and the composition of stars. Um, almost immediately, um, Angelo Secchi here on the left in the picture, who was a Jesuit priest, and uh, um, uh, Hudgens in England, who's on the right here, um, started observing stars with, uh, visually with uh, spectroscopes. And in the case of Sechi, he ended up looking at about 4,000 stars. And obviously, if you have a big sample like that, you can start classifying them in, into bins, which he did, um, into four big, broad uh, types of stars, basically stars that look like Sirius that are fairly hot and have just um, uh, uh, mostly the hydrogen lines. And then stars like the sun that have um, a, lar a large number of lines that are relatively weak. And then eventually the M giants, which have big broad absorption bands. And then uh, he uh, said she also identified uh, the quarter called carbon stars, which have big, uh, big broad uh, bands in the spectra due to uh, molecular carbon in the spectra that make them very red. And uh, he, he, could, he knew that the, these bands were, in, in the case of the carbon stars, were from carbon because he also had a chemistry lab and could see with his own Bunsen burner that if he uh, basically ran, uh, you know, uh, the fumes from a, a, a block of paraffin or benzene uh, into the Bunsen burner flame, that he would get an emission spectrum from the carbon. And so he knew exactly where they were and could identify them also in the stars as absorption bands. They didn't understand why they were two different ways like that, um, but uh, it was a start. And uh, similarly, Hudgens um, uh, observed everything that he could look at, Car uh, uh, comets, he looked at uh, novae, he looked at all the different stars, all the different types of stars, and, and um, took some of the very first actual photographs rather than just looking visually, he actually got some of the very early photographs of spectra of stars. Right. <clears throat> and then by the end of the century, um, uh, uh, Edward Pickering at Harvard had uh, collected a group of very industrious uh, women to start doing this, uh, uh, what was considered then the, the dog work of, of astronomy to <laughs> actually go through and look at, at photographic spectra of hundreds of thousands of stars that they had started to photograph with cameras, wide field cameras at Harvard. And um, the first in, in, in action was uh, um, Antonia Mari, who's here on the right, and who is really the uh, real theoretician, I guess, behind the stellar spectra. And um, then on the left is Annie Cannon, who um, uh, codified the system and made it much more, uh, well, it, it ended up that they, the way they made it more systematic, but the um, classification of the spectra they did um, fairly logically uh, by the strength of the hydrogen lines. So that you can see here in this, uh, a nice pretty panel here that the A stars um, had the strongest hydrogen lines, the B stars had the next strongest lines, and then down through the alphabet. They actually used most of the letters, but uh, they found that if they all, if they could get good spectra of each of the types, that they could consolidate a bunch of these letters. So that they ended up in this kind of mystical sequence of O, B, A, F, G, K, M, and mm -hmm. some other uh, modifications. So Annie, well, Annie Cannon ended up uh, classifying um, 
uh, something like 350,000 stars that were actually published and during her lifetime um, up until about 1940. And uh, you can see here in, the, in these nice colored plots that the hot stars, which are at the top of the list, um, have relatively simple spectra at this kind of uh, resolution. So that, and in fact, most of the, the, the lines you see here are mostly from helium rather than from uh, from ionized helium rather than hydrogen, but it turns out that a couple of the lines from the helium actually end up almost exactly at the same spot as the as the hydrogen lines. And then down toward the bottom as the stars are cooler, which we learned also about the same time, something like 120 years ago, that more and more of these uh, absorption lines that come from metals um, show up in the spectra, such that by the time you get to the sun here, the G, between G0 and G5, um, the, uh, lot, there are literally millions, tens of millions of lines from uh, all across the, uh, you know, the periodic table. So particularly across the middle of the, of the periodic table that you remember from high school with magnesium, hydrogen, titanium, cobalt, nickel, <laughs> all those elements um, produce uh, millions of lines, it turns out. And even, even 10 or 20 years ago, there were mi millions of these lines were not even identified, even in the solar spectrum, because the laboratory work had not been done to actually do all the, all the, all the calculations. So there's famous stars in here. I mean, the, the one, the example that's given in this, in this slide of, of the G0 star is, is called HD from the Henry Draper catalog, which Annie Cannon produced, HD20. 28099, and that is our friend Van B64 in the Hyades. So it's a star that's very similar to the sun and so at about a quarter of the age of the sun, um, but otherwise very similar to the sun itself. Then down below this, there's uh, <clears throat> this um, uh, SAO 76803, which is, is um, oh, excuse me, it's the one at the very bottom, the SAO 81292, which I had to look up since we don't use the SAO numbers so much anymore. That's, uh, right. That is um, AD Leonis, which is a very nearby dwarf star um, in, the, in, in the constellation Leo that's up in the evening nowadays. So that is a, a star that's young enough that it's still active and shows flares in the spectra. So this elaboration of the spectrum of spectra of the stars uh, got you know more and more elaborate um, as we were able to get better and better detectors, the photographic detectors, um, plates, photographic plates, and uh, um, you know as that, and so people were able to see these spectra at higher resolution, which continued to show more and more detail. And uh, so in the late and through the 1930s, well, once we had an atomic theory and could actually calculate where the lines should show up and so on, that happened just before the war, World War II. Um, and uh, a couple of guys, Bill Morgan and uh, Philip Canan, who were at uh, Yerkes Observatory at the time as students, um, uh, codified this system in, in, in two dimensions. One, the temperature that Annie Cannon had done, and then uh, another dimension in specifically the luminosity of the stars. So all of this classification of the stars has, has come a long way and, uh, you, know, you know, basically allows us to see what the, you know, a fraction at least of the tremendous amount of uh, information that the stars are broadcasting about themselves. <clears throat> So we're showing you these, these uh, nice uh, uh, sort of rainbow plots here of the photographic spectra. But it turns out, it's interesting that ironically, um, in the early days before there were photographs, the people like Sechi and Hudgens uh, made drawings and they made squiggly lines of the brighter parts and the dimmer parts of the spectra. And in, in the modern era with digital detectors, we've actually gone back to the squiggly lines <laughs> uh, that they used 170 years ago. <laughs> Right, we will, we will look at some squiggly lines. And which will be coming up, yes. And, uh, um, right, so this is basically um, uh, what you see is a temperature sequence here. And um, that's stemming from what we understand now of the, the physical properties of the atom and how atoms work as they absorb and emit light. Um, and it turns out, you, you know, these, these lines appear in very predictable spots because atoms absorb and emit based on their their um, electron structure and their energy state at very specific um, wavelengths. 
And so with that, you know, we can use these, these lines to deduce things like um, not only what the star is made of, but how abundant, right? So you see this spectrum, the, the third from the bottom is a sample of what's called a metal poor star. And, you know, in, in, in astronomer speak, there's only three elements, right? There's hydrogen, <laughs> helium, and metals. And so this is a star that just happens not to have much of, of anything heavier than helium. And you can see it's, it's again, like the, the hotter stars up here, it's a very sparse spectrum. Um, so, so we can deduce an enormous amount about the, the atmosphere of the star. And, and we'll, we'll go look at this in just a second. There is, there's a, a general question in the chat right now from, from Kenneth asking, um, hello from Flagstaff. Does anyone know of any astronomy clubs or groups in Flag? I recently invested in my first real telescope and would love to join and learn with other people. So yes, I would suggest you look up the Coconino Astronomical Society. Um, and they, they have programs up, they use our facilities for programs regularly. And I know they do star parties and lots of good folks there that, that I'm sure you'd enjoy meeting. So look up CAS. Okay, so let me, I'm gonna stop this share. And what we're gonna do now is switch over to some online resources. I'm actually gonna to go to my, my web browser um, and we're gonna look at a couple of sites that show you some of these squiggly lines as <laughs> there is the technical term for how <laughs> and, um, and there's some, some really interesting um, stars in here. So let me share this one. Um, make sure I get the right screen here. Here it is. Okay, um, so this, this site uh, is, this is Richard Gray's site. Um, he, I, he was here 10, more than 10 years ago. One yeah, he's visited here. There's a lot of work in stellar classification. It has this neat site. And here we can see some of these squiggly lines. And for instance, right in the middle, Brian, there, there's um, Vega. Vega. And, and you can see here, we're moving now from any, any Canon system into the full MK designations here. So, so the, uh, the, the Morgan and Canaan system uh, adopted these, the anti Canon letters. And uh, so the B5, A0, A5, so on, and then added a Roman numeral um, to indicate the luminosity. And, they turn, and the way they rigged it was to have a Roman numeral five, the V here for main sequence stars like the sun or stars that haven't evolved. Um, astronomers would say that they are heat, uh, hydrogen core burning stars. <laughs> But this is a, a, a sequence of the temperatures of fairly hot stars that are like Vega or sli and slightly hotter and slightly cooler. But you can see that as you go from something like 12 or 15,000 degrees down to um, something like 8,000 degrees surface temperature that the uh, just, well, first of all, you see the big broad lines are from helium or from hydrogen, excuse me. And um, those are the common feature in all of the, almost all the stars except the very coolest. And then in the B stars, we see these uh, uh, helium lines that are quite weak, but are nevertheless very diagnostic. And then as we get cooler and cooler down below where Vega is, all these metal lines start to show up from manganese, calcium, iron, magnesium over at near 44, uh, near 4,500 angstroms. And so those lines get stronger and stronger as the stars, those from the metals, get stronger and stronger as you go to the cooler stars. So they're starting from the relatively simple um, uh, mid B stars down to the mid A stars. Um, it's a fairly straightforward progression. And the way, you know, that when you look at a spectrum, I mean, the first thing you want to know about any star or any object in the sky is what's the spectral type? Well, and you know, for stars like this, the first thing you look at is the strength of this calcium line right here, relative to the to the to the on the on the left, relative to the uh, uh, hydrogen lines. You can see that it's just barely visible in the late B stars, and then gets stronger and stronger, such that down at the bottom for the A5 stars, it's that line is almost the depth of the of the of the Balmer lines, the hydrogen lines. Right, and it, you can just tell just at a glance, you know. Oh, the temperature is this for the star almost Incredible. right away. And if you remember the, the plot from uh, Fraunhofer, you might be asking, well, what happened to uh, calcium H? It's yeah, actually it's very, right in there right for H, H, H epsilon, the Balmer H epsilon line. So they got, so the Balmer lines, these hydrogen lines got uh, uh, re renamed yet again with Greek letters. <laughs> 
um, so that they, and once people for, uh, couldn't remember the order of the Greek letters after epsilon, and so they yeah. start giving them numbers instead, <laughs> just to keep things totally confused. <laughs> oh, just like that. Um, and so these, of course, are, are stars considerably hotter than what um, you and I have typically been studying, Brian. These are, these are yeah. more like the sorts of stars that Phil Massey and, and his colleagues have been studying. Yeah, these are roughly twice the temperature of the sun. Right. And of course, what's going on here up in these extremely hot stars, uh, they're so hot that, that most of these, these atoms down here are, are ionized and, and the electrons don't exist in a physical state where they can make a transition and create these lines. But as the star gets cooler, the physical conditions are right within the atoms for all these lines to begin to form. Um, and, and one point we might make, and then we'll move on to show you just how complicated <coughs> the spectra get in the weaker, the, the cooler stellar classes. Um, Vega is a, a very important star in that it's long been used as sort of a fundamental spectrophotometric standard, i.e. astronomers have reference stars that, that we use when we're trying to do um, absolute energy measurements and, and Vega has figured prominently in that. So it has a, he has a simple spectrum, even in, in that simple spectrum uh, with those only, only the very weak lines uh, persists out into the infrared. And so when we are observing now in the near infrared with, for instance, with the LDT and the night spectrograph or with Igrens and the past these different spectrographs, <clears throat> we want to take out uh, effects from the Earth's atmosphere. And a way to do that is to observe an A0 star like Vega um, to get a spectrum that has very few lines except for the lines and absorption bands that are coming just from the Earth's atmosphere. Right, right. So we keep observing those stars just to, for calibration of, and, the, uh, of the data. Exactly. And, and uh, just, just to be clear, <clears throat> it's only a fairly limited part of the spectrum, basically the near ultraviolet and only into the blue. So this is a... Yeah. Uh, 4,600 angstroms, 460 nanometers, and you can see over here hydrogen gamma. So the, the main Balmer lines of hydrogen um, beta is out at about 4,800, and then the, the Fraunhofer C or hydrogen alpha would be way off the end of the screen, yeah. 6560. Um, so all, all it, it, you know, it's an interesting thing that where the photographic plates were most sensitive in the old days was right in this part of the spectrum and in the blue and the violet. And, and it turns out that this is where all the action is in the stars in terms of the spectral features. There's not so much or it's harder to do out farther to the red. Nowadays. Right, it is harder because once you get to past 5,000 nanometers, you start picking up a forest. Yeah. Uh, water vapor lines and oxygen lines from Earth's pesky atmosphere. I and mean, it <laughs> makes it very much harder to disentangle. So let's go to some cooler stars. So again, this is the, the B and A portion of the, the Canon and, and MK classification scheme. Now we can go over and look at some G and K stars. And these are more like the kinds of stars that we've been looking at for decades. And look at the difference here when we're down to temperatures uh, fairly similar to the sun or a bit cooler. Right, so you can you can still see the uh, these hydrogen lines like the H gamma, sort of two thirds of the way to the to the right, and it's still there, but it's completely swamped by these other metal lines. And the the main uh, features that uh, we use to do the classification, uh, the temperature classification, are are indicated up at the top, um, so that the calcium and the iron lines and the magnesium lines are there are marked there. Um, but the Balmer lines uh, don't figure into this quite so strongly. And uh, uh, the uh, obvious thing that's amongst the uh, cool stars are the, is the calcium-2 H and K lines, still adopting the, the old Fraunhofer um, notation uh, on the left-hand side. And you can see that they are really the most prominent feature in the spectrum spectra. And in fact, for the sun, between 3,900 and 4,000 angstroms, there's not very much light coming out of the sun in that violet range um, because of those big broad lines uh, uh, from, the, from the spectra. And in the very bottom one for uh, 61 Cygni A, you can see that that line is, uh, those two lines are, they're a little bit clobbered by additional uh, metal lines, but also right in the middle, right at 39, 
35 or so and yeah. 3970 uh, yeah. right as Jeff is marking there there's these little bits where it goes up and you think that would be noise in the spectra um, but it's fact it's from a little bit of emission that's right above the uh, top layer of the star where the calcium has actually gotten hot enough that it's actually emitting um, and for a long time, uh, we observed stars with a spectrograph and even just with ordinary measuring the brightness of the stars, looking at changes in that, the core of those lines to look for variations like the 11 year sunspot cycle on the sun. Exactly. And we talked about that a little bit. And in, in, I think the last time you were on Cosmic Coffee and in fact, right. 60, um, in fact, um, all of these stars. Yeah, these are all on our program. <laughs> so, yeah. They're all friends of ours. Yeah. So, and you can see the emission. You'll notice in you know, like Beta Cone here is actually not a very active star. You don't see any emission there, but you can clearly see it here. And if you can see this, that's a very active star because uh, at this kind of plot and resolution, even at the, the solar maximum, you would not see a, an amount of emission anywhere near that. Um, so this is quite an active star. It's also very cool uh, spectral type K5, which is really getting down there. And uh, you can see a, a complicated spectrum. And you so made one other point, Brian, that I just wanted to mention quickly when you were talking about how the sun doesn't have much light coming out <laughs> here in, in this part of the spectrum. There, there are two main components of the spectrum. When we've really been talking about the line spectrum, there's also what we call the continuous spectrum in the star, which is the shape of a, a, a very characteristic shape we call a black body. And one thing you'll notice in these, these much hotter stars, you can clearly see the continuum. And actually what, what's been done here is we've divided the continuum out. So the continuum is normalized to one. Um, in these cooler stars, there are so many lines. You can sort of see the continuum here. It's kind of that level. But once you get down to these K stars, there are regions where there are so many lines the continuum is completely blanketed. And, and that actually makes it uh, very complicated to, in, to interpret, you know, where to put the lines and measure the emission. Right, so I mean, the, there, there's, you know, no, no little window or very few, only, only very narrow little windows where there's uh, just the general heat energy of the stars coming out without being impeded by some, uh, some atom atoms or molecules that are blocking right. the light. Pesky atoms. Yeah. Question has come in from a uh, good question from Jim Davies. Good morning, Jim. Um, does anyone take spectra from orbit? And if so, how different are they? <laughs> uh, the answer is yes. And of course, one of the one of the first things that people wanted to do when they uh, when the, at least astronomers got a hold of being able to uh, have some say in launching spacecraft was to get spectra from above the Earth's atmosphere. So you didn't have all of these problems uh, with the absorption of of uh, effects from the Earth's atmosphere itself, both um, from these bands and the spectra from Earth's atmosphere and, you know, the fact that it's cloudy and things like that. <clears throat> and so uh, what what do observing from orbit allowed us to do or from outside the Earth's atmosphere has allowed us to do is to see into the ultraviolet um, particularly and to see uh, hot uh, envelopes around stars and also uh, to see better in the uh, infrared where, again, there are uh, huge swaths of the spectrum that are absorbed by by the by the, mainly the water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, right. It's kind of kind of ironic that uh, uh, if you look at uh, the recent satellite weather satellite images, they're now available in very a large range of wavelengths, and the different wavelengths that they use for the weather satellites are exactly the places that we want to avoid to look at the stars. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. Because those are the ones that are getting, that have the water vapor and carbon monoxide and so on absorption, whereas we're trying to look out beyond that. But those, are, it's kind of the complementary effect of, of that. <clears throat> right. And now, um, just for our last topic this morning, to give you a taste of, of abnormal spectra. Really, so far, we've been talking about pretty normal stars, even... 61 Sig A here is a K5 main sequence star. So this is a hydrogen burning sort of healthy star, even though it is very active. Um, these are all what we would probably call fairly normal spectra, but other types of stars sh show things decidedly different. And for that, we're going to give you just one example and show you a few slides. This is from uh, 
astronomer Fred Walter's site, and we're going to look at spectra of the CTTS. So let's let's talk <laughs> about those, uh, Brian. <laughs> so uh, Fred Walter is an expert on uh, what are called uh, Titari stars, and and his the first slide here is classical Titari stars, and those have uh, uh, those are, these are very young stars. They're actually similar to the sun in mass but uh, at least within its modest range, but are very young and are still accreting material from their natal cloud uh, into forming the star itself. And, and we think planets also probably at the same time. And if you look at these uh, plots of the spectra, the, the squiggly lines, uh, you see that there's not much where, you know, where are all our absorption lines? <laughs> and <laughs> there are very few uh, lines that are coming from the actual absorption of the atmosphere, of the, the photosphere of the star that's actually still forming. And um, a lot of these are stars that uh, the group that, that's being led by Lisa Prato here at Lowell, uh, of which I am a member, um, uh, studying these stars in detail. And so uh, um, there are these basically stars, that, at least in the visible, um, have no photospheric lines, no lines from the, the, the basically the outside of the star, but instead, what we see are most, is mostly the accretion disk of the star that's uh, accreting and, uh, along magnetic field lines and onto the star. And then uh, as, the, as the stuff, the gas and dust is accreting onto the star, it's often hitting the surface of the star and generating these very bright hot spots that are producing these emission lines. That instead of having absorption in these various places in the spectra, they are emitting um, uh, as a bright emission spike in the in the plot of the brightness versus wavelength, and so these uh, st the stars are changing um, quite a lot because that that accretion activity changes, and the amount the, the, depending on what their I don't know how you, how you call it their evolutionary state, how far they are, are along from just having a hot cloud to actually having a star, um, the proper star like, like we've been looking at, um, depends on and how fast that accretion of the stuff is happening, then you have the uh, lines will be greater and weaker strength and vary from hour to hour even. So that R.W. Arigai here in the upper right corner of these, this panel um, is just this forest of emission lines, whereas um, other of the stars are, have only basically the hydrogen emission and some helium uh, lines in, in emission. Yeah, um, so this right here is hydrogen alpha. Yeah, right. Heavily in emission. Right. And there's actually a little representation, I guess. So here's, yeah, yeah. here's sort of the cartoon version. <laughs> As someone has said, you know, we have this fairy tale about how the stars form, and that's a whole different topic to talk about. Yeah. Um, but we think that these stars have both, both hot spots and dark spots on the on the surface of the star, so that there are some uh, absorption features, um, but really dominated by these uh, by these by the secretion of the gas onto the surface of the star. Right, and yes, and variable on time scales of. I'm going to stop the share now. Variable on time scales of yeah hours to minutes, and even for what we might call slightly more normal stars, um, you know, stars that have finished this formative period, you know. Frequently, when we look up at the sky, most of the stars you see up there are in fact binaries. And we've talked about some of these in previous cosmic coffees, often where the stars are fairly widely separated and you measure the, the, their periods of revolution in, in decades, you know, it can be 30 or 40 years. But many of these binaries are very close and have orbital periods of weeks to days. And those uh, spectra often show tremendously enhanced emission. And again, the patterns in those spectra allow you to identify different classes of, of, of binary stars uh, according to their particular type of pathology. Yeah, the spectrum tells all. It does tell all. <laughs> so I hope this has given you a little bit of a, a glimpse into how we classify stars and understand what's going on out there. We'll ask for any finer, final questions coming in on the feed. Um, while I just preview what's coming up for Cosmic Coffee, um, next week, actually, Cosmic Coffee will take a break. It's August, uh, April 22nd, which is Earth Day, and we will instead have a special Earth Day uh, live stream with Dr. Gerard Van Bell. And then in two weeks, April 29th, 
Cosmic <clears throat> Coffee will be back. Um, every three months or so for the past year, we've taken a little detour out from astronomy to draw on the expertise of our local uh, pathogen experts. And so I'll be joined uh, once again by Dr. Dave Engelfaller. Um, now that we are, we are into phase two of our reopening uh, here at Lowell, we're starting to see a few more tours going by and, and I've got all the same questions everybody else does as to, you know, what's the status of travel and, and transmission and mask use now that I'm happily fully vaccinated? Um, what's the state of these variants and, and where, where are we really going with these case surges that we're seeing? Um, Dave is a, a highly authoritative voice on all of this and we'll try to get all of the information out and, and answer all of your questions. So that'll be two weeks from today. On here on Cosmic Coffee. So until then, as always, um, stay well, stay safe, and we'll see you next time.